Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Eels. I'm the head at University High School and uh, super happy to be celebrating Chris Ray's back class of 81. Going to let him catch his breath from uh, taking a little break from what sounds like heroic, heroic work you're doing. Chris is one of uh, two recipients of our alumni honors this year. And it's super great to see the class of uh, 81 showing up um, for Chris and for each other today. Um, founded in 2018, which now feels like a century ago, um, our alumni honors program is designed to recognize and acknowledge the contributions of alumni who embody our core values. And we're really proud of the fact that we established a set of core values for the school about six years ago um, to ensure that we're staying aligned with um, things that are important to us, inquiry, care, integrity, agency, and interconnection. We believe that all recipients of alumni honors are making important contributions at a local, national, and international level through personal accomplishment, achievement professionally, and humanitarian service in support of those values. Um, today, Chris is going to be in conversation with Corinne Limbach, who is the UHS Director of Health and Wellness and Chair of our Human Development Department. Corinne will introduce Chris shortly, but I'd love to take a moment to tell you a little bit about our HD program. The University High School Human Development Curriculum was designed to support overall cognitive, social, and emotional development for each student by creating opportunities for experience and project-based learning. Um, I, uh, this year, uh, we've all been challenged by ways to help our kids stay engaged in their um, uh, emotional um, uh, uh, support and uh, learning. Um, and in some ways, uh, while, while Zoom has been helpful, it's really required that the HD department uh, really pivot and be creative. And uh, with Corinne's leadership, we have actually had one of the most robust years of connection, interconnection, um, and, um, and emotional learning at a time that it was so, so desperately needed. Um, the curriculum spans all four years of a student's time at UHS, focusing on five main areas, learning and metacognition, cultural competency and literacy, health and wellness, community engagement, and college counseling. The HD faculty work closely with one another, as well as with mentors, which are, as you remember, advisors, to design, deliver, and support learning that aligns with our mission, philosophy, and goals for student competencies in general. As the Director of Health and Wellness, Corinne fosters a school community where students feel empowered to talk openly about, about issues that can be taboo, um, things like identity, mental health, body image, disordered eating, substance abuse, and sexuality. She works closely with school counselor, dean of students, our mentors, peer advisors, and student club leaders. And Corinne facilitates really meaningful and deep dialogue that can decrease stigma in our community and work to create holistic systems of support for all of our students. Corinne has been a bright light every year, but this year specifically. So it's a really, um, it's an honor to turn the Zoom spotlight over to Corinne, who will introduce Chris. Thank you so much, Julia. And I just have to say, it's been such a pleasure just to show up in this Zoom space, which is a lot livelier and more exciting than some Zoom spaces I've been in recently. So it's just such a treat to be here with you all. And um, I'm so excited to talk more um, with Chris, who just I find fascinating and so cool to bring to our school um, community now. Um, Chris Raisbeck believes it's no coincidence that he is named after St. Christopher, who is the pa patron saint of travelers, because he really has found his calling, um, helping others through transitions of all kinds through their life. Um, in his lifetime, he's worked with youth as a health educator, so we definitely have that in common, um, and was a part of a team of teachers who brought GLSEN um, to California in the 90s. Um, he served the adult LGBTQ community as an activist, advocate, and counselor from the um, beginning of the AIDS uh, HIV epidemic through today. 
Um, in our conversation today, Chris will reflect on what he's learned on his journey um, and what work is left for us all to, to do and is still to be done. Um, just to let you know, um, I, I say this all the time to my students now, but um, in case there might be younger siblings or little kids in the room, um, we might be talking about like some of those taboo topics that I love to go into. So if that's something that you or your family doesn't feel as appropriate, like just be aware that it might be a good time to find a private space for this um, Zoom conversation. Um, Chris, before we dive into all of our questions, I just, it's, I'm going to do my best to keep us on track because there's so many things that we want to talk about. And, you know, the two of us could probably talk all day about them. So if I have to steer us back into conversation, um, hopefully I have your permission to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually want to take a moment just because I was screened through the windows just to see who's there. And I want to tell you, my heart just feels right now because the woman who first took us on our very first service learning adventure ever, picking grapes, is sitting in here right now. Thank you, Rhonda. <laughs> and she's, she, she, there as a freshman class, we got to go and um, pick grapes. We gleaned afterwards. And um, that commitment that University High School has done to make sure that we get out in community was started, a little, you know, back in 77. And Rhonda, I'm looking in your eyes right now. It's so glad I'm so glad to see you. It means everything. So thank you. I'm um, so glad to I, see you. I just want to, and I just want to acknowledge that because my that that's kind of connection between the teachers and the students goes out through our lives. Rhonda and I also she's been my cooperating teacher, she's been my supervising teacher, and we were actually colleagues. Um, yeah. and then most recently we went into medicine, and she. I uh, did my medical Spanish class. So wow. this, this connection that goes on with people at University High School can go on for years. It is absolutely has enriched my life. And my, mi corazón, I mean, just so yeah. much. Yeah, igualmente. And, <laughs> and I <laughs> love you, Chris. Both, love you too much. Um, I also I see some of my classmates. And first of all, thank you, University High School, for recognizing me. I think our class was the, was the largest that University High School had ever had. And we were probably, I like to say, we spread the net very wide. I think our population would never have gotten in the, at the University of Houston now, but because of it, we were a bunch of very interesting people. And I see, I see Paula Scott, who I haven't seen forever. I see a whole variety of people. And we all had interesting stories about how we got to the University of High School, not necessarily whom you might think would be a traditional student, but they really want to reach out and give a lot of different types of students. And you know, I, I feel very humbled by receiving the award because every single one of us has gone on to do some amazing things. And I can't wait to see them again on Saturday as we get together for our 40th. Yay. So I'll stop. I just want to put that little <laughs> plug in there because thank you. I, I mean, I, any one of my classmates could have been acknowledged in the very same way. They've done some amazing things. So but thank well, you. We're here to talk about, thank I mean, you. <laughs> We're going to talk about your amazing things I know. today, and um, I know you gave us a little preview that you right now are working in um, the, you're in a travel lodge right now, you're like in a room at work, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your current service work, and I know sure. um, right now, especially COVID and this past year has made a huge impact on that, so I'd love to yeah. have you share a little bit more about that with us. Sure, so about eight years ago, I made the decision to go from education into medicine, and I did some, some training. And my main thing is I want to get my hands in, thank you, um, my hands into working with, with uh, patients and doing hands-on, you know, I did hands-on science, I wanted to do some hands-on medical work. So I want to get in offices with my hands-on patients, helping them find better options in terms of their wellness. Um, and in my role, we really need to become expert patient navigators. So we'd be able to be able to listen to what the patient's saying, but maybe steer them in a direction that's going to give them better recept, better um, resources, as well as um, sometimes help them explore certain types of care that would be better for them. My neighbor who lives right above me had a stroke a year ago, and I knew as his care was beginning that it was really important we see to the doctor, he needs integrative care. Mm. And she was able to arrange that right off there and it made his recovery from the stroke so much better. So, yeah. but as of March, well, basically for me it was March 6th, but for many of us, it was March 6th, 16th. 
when suddenly our lives changed dramatically mm -hmm. because the city was shut down and I went from clinical work into swabbing noses. And for 12 hours a day, I was shoving swabs up people's noses. I was that person that you don't like and did the, the, the booger pick and then slide it back out. And then we would, could run the tests where I was working within about 10 minutes and we'd have a pretty reliable result. Um, there's also sort of the, what I think is the patient care that needs to go on with that because you're dealing with people's health and also they're, they're terribly scared about what this may mean. So um, I did that for about 10 and a half months and that was intense. Um, you know, we had, I think every one of us probably had been tested a couple of times. It's, it's stressful. It's, it's, um, it's mildly uncomfortable for a short time, but I also think it's super important that we all continue to monitor our, our, our thoughts about how we move around in community. From there, and so there, you know, it was interesting that at this very same time, the place where I was located was up, up on a rooftop. And at the same time, you know, these, these issues, social issues are not isolated. Yeah. At the same time, we have all the protest march going by for BLM. Mm -hmm. We had all the, all the protests going on for all, any varieties of things. Yeah. And I'm thinking, it, it was literally like watching our world just kind of really show its struggle. Mm -hmm. And um, there are moments I know I would watch from the rooftop and thought, I thought we made progress on this. I thought we'd, we'd done good. I thought that my mixed nephew, who has, has mixed race, wouldn't have to survive and have these types of things go on. Yeah. Um, but that is, this year, as we all know, has revealed a lot of interesting things. Yeah. Um, so I was very hands on that. And then um, I was aware that I was that the direction of my profession is going to be kind of stuck in this and I might as well do something that I enjoy in it than something that's really pulling from my soul. <laughs> so um, I have always loved the mission of Health Right 360. Um, actually, right before I started working for their urgent care, I actually did accept a position here and also there at the same time trying to figure out which one I wanted to do. And I'm now back at Health Right 360. I love their mission. They're very interested in providing healthcare for all. Right. And we supply health for all kinds of folks throughout San Francisco, some who may not have any other option. And that requires a wonderful approach. The thing I particularly love about my job right now is we are housing folks who need to do that 10 to 14 day quarantine because they have been recently exposed, they've been tested positive when they would be most virulent and they be most contagious, or you know, there, there may be other mitigating conditions. And you know, we're, the, we're the friendly face that they get to see right when they get off the bus and we help guide them through those 10 days to ensure their health. We have daily checks to make sure we know how their health is going. If they're having any increased symptoms, we try and do what we can with medication. We, um, if anything turns a little bit untoward, we immediately get them to the emergency room. It's a really amazing program that the city has set up and it's free. Wow. It's free to, to anyone in San Francisco, even people who are visiting San Francisco. And this goes way back to you know, the 60s when the fire children were in San Francisco. It was, um, I think it's written into the charter of the city that we will take care of people's health if you, if you yep. come here. And um, I, and so glad to see that. We had one gentleman who, were, who was up in San Francisco for two days for a job interview. During that time, he presented with a cough. He ended up at Chinese Medical. And from there, they put him on med transport, dumped him here because he tested positive. And he's like, you know, I, thank you, Rhonda, because I could speak Spanish to him. Um, okay. We, we were able, because he didn't understand quite what was happening. And we were able to assure him, you're going to be safe. We're going to provide your meals. You're going to have to be here for 10 to 14 days. We will do everything we can to keep you well. Um, he knew no one in California, no one in San Francisco. And, you know, he's sick in a foreign country. It'd be terrifying. But yeah. we really were able to talk him through what symptoms he may have. Um, he, you know, he's someone who, who got kind of sick with, the, with flu symptoms for a couple of days. And then they're pretty good. Um, and at the end, we, I, was, I was so proud of us because we were able to get his uh, discharge done, put him in metatransport. He immediately went to the SFO. I already cleared with United Airlines with and sent the discharge letterhead. So we go from San Francisco to Houston, Houston down to Central America. 
because at that time, you know, you want to get home and you yeah. don't want to have any kind of hiccup going on. So um, those are the things, you know, those are some, that's one proof that San Francisco is going to do that for its, its visitors. We also have folks who may be homeless or who are um, <laughs> residentially challenged as I was <laughs> instructed by one of my doctors recently. Um, but these are folks who are really struggling and certainly with what's going on with COVID, we have an increased number of people. There are people who've gone from their homes into motor homes that all yeah. line our streets everywhere just so they have a place to live. And if anything happens in those motor homes, if we've had three examples of this, where people's motor homes burn down and they're sitting this in the street with oh. their dog or their cat or their belongings and they get put, put in metatransport and at least for 10 to, 10 to 14 days, we ha they have a place that's safe to be. And, and a um, program, no, it's so true. And a program yeah. like that is so yeah. vital for the care, comprehensive care of, of the community, but it mm -hmm. wouldn't function, right? Without people like you who were able to show yes. care and basic humanity mm -hmm. to any single person who walked in its doors, like regardless of anything about them, their identity, where they're from, where yeah. they live, what kind of clothes they're wearing, like the ability to just look past all of that and see them as a human in need, mm -hmm. like that, like a program like that just wouldn't function without people like you to, to be the, in the front lines there, you know? Well, well as, mm -hmm. as with some many things, and I, I'm really incredibly grateful this is the case, we have an incredible person as our medical director. Yeah. Dr. Ana Valdez is so smart, so even keeled, so approachable, very much in, when she was interviewing me, she said, you know, I just need to let you know, we're doing medicine on the fringe. We have patient or people who come into our, our care. They're addicted. They have alcoholism. They have any kind of comorbidity. We got to get them through the 10 days. Our job is about their Right. Their care in regard to COVID. If they're going to need Suboxone or met, met, um, Methadone, we need to be able to supply that. If it means that they got to run out and get their fix and come back so they can be safe during that 10 days, we're going to need to be able to do that. And it's a come, it's, we really look at, at treatment of addiction from the point of harm reduction. Yeah. And that's a, that's a hard one for many of us to kind of wrap our mind about. Yeah. But I would rather have people healthy and getting through this and then dealing with that because yeah. no one's going to no one's going to cure addiction in 10 days and no. in fact taking someone who is an alcoholic and not allowing them to have a little bit of alcohol that we can actually titrate out means that they're going to go into dt's and may have some very serious health right. as how things out if not death yeah so yeah. i i love that our medical director gets that that she sets the tone for the rest of us that she's hired staff that really get really are excited and embracing that and that are willing to take that moment and look at the whole person That's so the whole person well chris i'm i'm curious it sounds like clearly you are so knowledgeable and um deeply in tuned with harm reduction and care and these higher level higher level ideas when it comes to service work and i would love to hear a little bit about actually what very first brought you into that work? Like what was it um, that first when you were maybe, um, you know, years and years ago, what first brought you into the service work that you, um, that started your journey? When I was in fifth grade, my dad's mom, my grandmother fell and broke her hip. And my dad was an orthopedic surgeon. He did hip replacements. But mm -hmm. at that time, um, if when you fell and broke your hip, you go into care. And sometimes that was kind of your, you know, your quality of life immediately started slipping. Mm. And from a very early age, I went and spent afternoon time with my grandmother just to, just to make sure that she had companionship and someone to be around her. Um, I felt like it was, it's just, it was just a very natural thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. And anyone who knows me and knows me well, they know that I'm a caretaker, but even to my own fault, <laughs> um, I will go and sacrifice everything about myself including my sleep and, and well-being to make sure that others are well. And that's not, I'm trying to learn to be better, but um, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is really something I understand about myself. And mm -hmm. it's important to me that if someone is in need and I have an ability to be able to lighten their load in some way, 
that would um that that's something that was important to me. I want to loop back to the introduction when you mentioned um, it's no surprise to me. Um, so St. Christopher of No officially is a, is a patron saint of travelers, but if you delve deeply, um, he was not a man of the cloth, he was a man of the heat. Mm -hmm. And St. Christopher was a companion to a bishop, yeah, he's a, a companion to a bishop, we might say a special companion to the bishop, <laughs> to help him navigate from one village to the next safely so they wouldn't be attacked by marauders or be lost or not have food. And when I honestly, I did not know that about St. Christopher until I was right after I actually met my birth mom. Oh, wow. And she, she was the one that had selected my name and my parents honored that name. And when I learned that, I thought, oh my God. I mean, rather, have I not been the first in middle school? You're middle school, you're taking from the really awkward time to something better. You're taking people from this place that's uncertain for them yeah. I'm trying to move them into a place that's, that's better. Um, it is no surprise to, well, let me pause. Also, when I was 28, my mom died very suddenly of cancer. It was a four month period. And it was really important to me that I figured out what was going on because the rest of my four siblings, it just, it was changed our world forever. And in that time I learned about ho what hospice was. Mm -hmm. And I have, <laughs> not by looking but by by just as it presents itself but every 18 months someone comes into my life my friend's life or my family who is needing care in hospice and I've been able to when appropriate step in and give some guidance to them mm -hmm. most my most recent person I did that before was a woman that actually did the last bit of my hospice training um, mm -hmm. here in the city she believed that it's important to have touch at end of life. And yeah. really her whole motion movement was about um, uh, make, providing hospice massage for those who are in hospice or very, very sick. It came out of the move of HIV care um, yeah. when Luna Honda and both 46 were having people run. But touch is something that we need all the way through our life. Yep. And I'm sad to say that she was diagnosed with with uh, esophageal cancer in December. And she made the conscious decision that she wanted to stay at home for hospice. She actually was one of the main trainers at the Zen Buddhist Hospice Center, which most of us got our training through. And so her last month of care was provided by people, students of hers who she had taught. Mm -hmm. And what's even more beautiful about that for me is the pioneers in hospice care were a gentleman named Stephen Levine and also Elizabeth Kubler Ross. And Irene was trained by Elizabeth Kubler Ross. And to be able to get that lineage of care and what it means to be present during this very special time of someone's life. And it is remarkable those last few days. It's it's hard for all of us as the spirit is separating from the body, but it's the most remarkable thing to sit with someone. And I thought that I thought that I was not going to get much interaction with Irene. But in fact, when she's, as she's sitting in the hospital bed, um, unable to eat, hasn't eaten for four days, we're sitting and we're talking and reminiscing about things that she remembers and how grateful I was about her giving me training. Yeah. And at a time, I know, <laughs> at a time when, when she actually got to the point, she said, I, I can't even be touched, she said, it, things hurt. She extended her hand, and I extended mine, and I just held, and, you know, th that was the way we could touch at the end of her life to know that what, what we do is important. And it was, I felt like I was giving her blessing, she would give me a blessing to continue my work. And also for her to know that what she has done has changed lives in a very positive way. And what, what better way to honor someone um, is to surround them with as much love as you can right at the end of life. So, whew, okay, I got some tears going. So, um, yeah, but it's very meaningful and I, I used to kind of resist the opportunities when this, they come, but now I, I swear I can like sniff them out when they're coming. Yeah. Um, but that, again, I mean, Memorial will, will be next week and I can't, I am excited by it. And yet I also know all of us are going to die. I'm sorry to share it with us, with us all, but we are all <laughs> going to die. And I think that we can do some conscious planning about what our choices are if, if we get to that point. Um, it, it, it makes it easier for the people around, but I think it probably gives peace of mind to the person who's in the process of dying also.
so um yeah so it, it's it's that's so my involvement in service how i got looped into this it's i think it's my personality mm -hmm. i think also it is something that um certainly as a teacher you and particularly for junior high and for, particularly because i did like outdoor education you you're in local parentes as we've all learned you are in the place of the parent and it's very important you can hold safe what is going on for people and yeah. it is no it is no surprise to me that i go from the very codependent teacher role to the very codependent um nursing and care role so um I laugh about it, but it's 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 true. And the trick is though, is to be able to hold balance for yourself. Yeah. To be able to care for others, but yet still remember to care for self. And um, I have to say, I know that will be a lifelong practice for me. Mm -hmm. Um and I really encourage anyone who is getting moved by all this, we've got to remember we have to take care of ourselves. Yeah. Um this shell of a body that we have, whether we love it or not, we're stuck with it until we get we leave. And um, we might as well do what we can to take care of it. And also our mental health. And it is Mental Health Month, so little props for that right now. Well, thank you for that reminder. And I'm right there with you as <laughs> someone yeah. who's worked in service work and as an educator. I uh, I absolutely agree that prioritizing our our care for ourselves is. Just it's, it's, it's so important and it's difficult, but it's a challenge that's worth taking on. And um, I actually want to transition to talking a little bit about your um, role in education. And I want to start by saying that I think one interesting thing that we've seen as part of this kind of um, remote year with teenagers is that um, a lot of students at our school, but you know, I'm seeing this across schools. I'm hearing this from my friends who work with teenagers that the this opportunity to like be in their own homes and do school remotely, while it's been challenging for a million different reasons, one positive aspect of it is it has allowed some students to really explore um, their gender expression, their sexual identity, all of these different aspects, you know, their acceptance of their bodies and what that means means um, in ways that they might not feel comfortable um, doing on campus in front of like 400 people. Um, mm -hmm. so it's been really interesting to see how this kind of freedom of being at home and privacy has allowed for that exploration and self-compassion. And I know um, that as a junior high, high school teacher and educator, you um, worked really, really hard to create compassionate communities in the schools that you were in um, by bringing in Gay Straight Alliances. You know, we talked about GLSEN, um, Laramie Project. And I'd love to just hear about that idea of like um, compassionate communities, especially for, um, you know, adolescents um, as they're going through that life transition. Sure. So my, my history with that kind of goes like this. Um, when I, I taught for two years at, at a Polytechnic School, two years at San Francisco Day, went up to do my master's because there's the only place in the whole Western Pacific Bacon Basin that I had my degree. I was absolutely planning coming right back to California, but I, I actually was detoured by helping to open an aquarium, which I, I love doing. But um, when I returned to Southern California, um, I myself was a little bit different as a person. I had, in fact, I went to the same school, which is kind of cool. I started teaching at Pasadena, in Pasadena Polytechnic School for two years when I first started teaching. At that point, I got married to, um, to a woman, Jean, who I was married with for about eight and a half years. And when I returned to Poly, she and I divorced, I had come out I'd had a few years kind of practice and figure out what the, my own sexuality was going to be about. Although I will say coastal Oregon <laughs> gay community is going to be dramatic, radically different than what I might have been experiencing in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> there were eight gay men in a 25 mile mine, uh, radius. There were 65 lesbians in the same zone. But, wow. um, but anyway, so the transition from there into um, Los Angeles seemed to me to be something I need to be very conscious about. And it seemed only natural when I was at Polytechnic School and we had about eight 
independent school teachers from throughout the um, CIS network that said, you know, we want to make sure our classrooms are safe. We know that if a kid is coming around school and we're afraid that they're not going to be able to learn as well. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're to your point, you know, with kids being able to explore some parts of themselves at home, yes, they're yes. able to do that very safely. And in that way, then they can become more whole. So, um, so we put together some funds and we brought this high school teacher out from Boston. His name was Kevin Jennings. He was just a high school teacher at the time. We're like, okay, well, this is good. This is someone who can, who can speak our language. And he talked to us about how we can make sure our classrooms themselves are safe and actually work as leaders within our schools to be able to make um, appropriate curriculum to be able mm -hmm. to discuss different alternative sexualities from kindergarten all the way through. Um, we were then held the very first California Glisten Conference at which Jamie Lee Curtis spoke. Um, it was the year that um, It's Elementary was released where <laughs> teacher, you know, it was the, and I remember seeing it in, in the auditorium as a group and we're just like, wow, we're really, it, it's like we're pinching ourselves. Like, are we really creating change right like this? And I think the most telling part for me was about eight years ago, I was at Christmas time, I was talking to my nieces and nephews and my niece just offhandedly said, oh, you know, we have gay straight lines in both the junior high and high school. What are you talking about? And I'm like, and I remember stopping my tracks and thought, I mean, we, what we did at that time, like almost 20 years ago, we did it because we knew it was the right thing to do for kids in our own classrooms. Yeah, That's what we knew was right. And we were yeah. hoping that enough people would listen to what we felt was true. Because it didn't matter if you were gay, straight, purple, green, whatever it was, whatever your difference was, we know that people will learn and grow better when you're in an environment where you can feel care and love and you can feel valued yeah. for who you are. And so we worked to be able to emulate and to model that in our classrooms. So um, again, I had, you know, we did that at the time because it was the right thing to do. And I've watched Glitz and Grow since, and I had other sort of directions in my life. So I've seen it, but I tell you, it warms my heart every once in a while when I think back, here we up at Idlewild, we're kind of gathered around this big work table and trying to put some ideas together. And what books did you know that you've used? Or, you know, you, you know here's, you know the lesbian couple that we have that are parents how can we best support them it yeah. was just an incredible set of creative discussions that then let the framework for this um so i you know i didn't do that for guts or glory i did it because i knew it was the right thing to do for the kids who were around and you know i think anyone who's been a teacher and has sense to do this within the first five minutes we know who the ADHD kids are. <laughs> we know exactly who's going to be struggling with some kind of identity issue. <laughs> we, we, have, we have a sense of who is going to be bored and, and we're thinking, well, now what's probably going to be bored because that's the interesting part. Um, and there's just things we pick up on things real quick. And I, I love that as we as teachers fine tone our fine tune our, our skills in terms of reading what's happening with our students. And that's a whole level of things going on beyond the level of, okay, today we're gonna learn the colors, four different colors of whatever, you know. We're, <laughs> we're really looking, you're, we're really connecting with the students and making sure what we're putting out is gonna be something that they can hang, hang on to and really plant those seeds so that, that they can grow in their own garden of wisdom as life goes on. Yeah. Absolutely. It's so true. I think we all fool ourselves into thinking that what students are going to take away from their high school experiences are like the facts that we teach them when really so much of it is just this general like sense of safety, belonging, self-exploration, um, and identity development, which exactly is what you're saying. They can only do if we um, create spaces where they can feel safe and loved. Um, so, I mean. And, and, and as we know, kids learn more about us by what we do. Yes. Not what we say, oh, but yeah. what we're actually doing. Yeah. And if we can adopt and share the practices of that, that's where we, we um, I think so we make progress. Uh, two seconds, I had a woman in front of me one, a, a week ago who was driving with two, three other kids in their car. She's ramming through the things and honking at me because she's on her cell phone and yelling. And by the third one, I'm like, okay. 
Now <laughs> she's going to get it. I pulled my car across the intersection there, walked up. I looked her in the eye and said, what concerns me about you talking on your phone and flipping <laughs> me off is that you have other ki parents' kids in your car right now. Yeah. And those parents don't want to have you driving with your, on your cell phone. That's my issue. Yeah. Nice. And she's... <laughs> <laughs> and she said, "You're a." Mm. And this I is said, nice. That kind of language, yeah. your daughter was sitting here. Yep. Yeah, they made it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. She was expecting me to come out with something different. I said, "You're not. No, you're taking you're, you're taking other parents' kids into your life by behaving like that. That's not not yeah. okay." So anyway, <laughs> actions, not words. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, so much of that. Um. I guess I want to make sure we leave some time for questions at the end, but before we do that, I just would love to kind of leave us with um, one thing that I really want our human development program to work on with students is this idea of kind of like really redefining what success means. And I think when, um, Adolescents first start high school, they often see success in this like really narrow lens, which might mean going to a specific college, it might mean getting certain grades, it might mean, you know, in the future making X amount of money or this or whatever. And to me, that's so narrow. And I'd love to hear from you, like if you were to give advice to your high school self or a current high school student at UHS. How, how would you define success and what advice would you give them to kind of like, you know, find a, a life that feels to them fulfilled instead of maybe successful? So, so this is a question we, we talked about before and I'm, I have to say this is why this particular award means so much to me because I am not the brightest and the best of my class. I, I, you know, I was a kid who had very um, vigorous ADHD that was untreated. We didn't, I struggled to, to be able to, I mean, what took most people about an hour to be able to complete an assignment generally took me about an hour and a half because I knew I was so antsy while I was doing it. Mm -hmm. um, for me to process, um, like just to put together an essay, you know, when you're trained to be one, A, B, C, two, A, B, C. That's not how my mind works. And it was only until college that I learned how to, you know, cluster ideas and then I could make it linear um, did, did it happen. But it, it's for someone who is a non-traditional learner. And Rhonda, thank you so much for maintaining in our hearts that you have to have hands on, you gotta have the stuff right in front of you where you're actually touching it and you're moving. Um, that, I love you for that, thank you. Um, <laughs> There is, it was that kind of thing because I knew I was a non-traditional learner that I knew I had to bring into my classes and to be able to teach general biology where you're immediately going into the biochemistry of stuff. It's like, whoa, that's so, it's like, all this is is a roller coaster ride. We're going to come here and I'm going to go here. Just know that the names aren't so important, but it's a process. And then the rest of it's going to make sense of getting in and we get to do the fun stuff. But to be able to do that and present it in a way that was tangible and digestible to kids while you're using basically the foreign language of, of biology and science was, was super amazing to me. I think about success. I think I kind of gave, took the pressure off myself very early on because I was not a strong academic student. I was trying as best as I could. Um, certainly my self-esteem not wound up and all that because you know people are going off to various colleges and universities. And you know I, I had this aspiration of going to vet school, but I kind of knew that I would have to have some kind of miraculous GPA to be able to have that happen. And in fact, it didn't after, after organic chemistry, I'm like, okay. But I, I have to say, you, I think, you know, they always say, you know, follow your passion and you'll find joy. Um, and part of it is that we've got to figure out what is our passion. And I know that for me, whatever it is the, in my DNA or whatever it is that in my life experience or whatever, the ability to sit in front of someone, be present and sort of turn on my, my sixth sense and kind of listen to what's going on and then be able to maybe nudge them in a direction that can be helpful is, is something that's important to me. 
to be able to feel that they can be empowered for their own wellness and health um, is the thing that, that really gets me excited and moving. Um, and it took me some time to figure that one out because I, I, you know, I, I've had careers both in education and in some industry and, and now with, with medicine, you know, I, I would love to maybe progress in a different way in medicine, but there's not really the, if I go to PA school for right now, I'm basically going to be over 60 before I can start my PA ship and then I'm going to have a $150,000 Jewish tuition that I'm like, you know what? In my life, I don't think it's gonna bring me happy. I mean, parts would be happy, but I've got to find out what's gonna work for me. And what I know works for me is the day-to-day, face-to-face interaction with people and help, and helping them, again, shepherding them, guiding them, pulling on my St. Christopher talents just to get them to the next place that would be safe for them. Yeah. And um, I, I think once I kind of got that, it has made a lot of the decisions in my life so much easier um, and I think that because I didn't have to worry about being the top achiever or something, that I just had to be able to do what I knew I could do was my best. Um, and to practice, and I, I can't show you this right now, but I have a tattoo that's sent down here. Um, there's a period of time after my mom died and I had divorced and um, had had a lot of challenges. Thank you, Kathy. Um, my advisor from high school, New Chester just popped on. Um, the, the tattoo itself is Maori in design. Mm. And the first tattoo is here and it's, it's, looks, it's a cancer zodiac sign, which is two interlocking claws. Um, but also cancer has affected my life very early on. Both my mom yeah. and my wife died of cancer. And I didn't want to, and I want to walk with that every day over my heart that yeah. these two very influential women in my life can still walk with me in some way. And then as you extend down my arm, I have a tattoo that is a Maori. It is a Maori design or image that represents gratitude. Mm. And I know after some challenges in life, it would have been really easy to be bitter and mad and mean. But I really felt if I can not lose the lesson and I can be grateful for what has happened, the good or the bad, that that was going to be a healthier, healthier place for me to go and to be. And yeah. um, then there's the weird numbers of it. There's two images here, there's three on my shoulder. And as you go down there, it's a mix of four. And then I have five fingers. And it was literally in the middle of the last tattoo when I took that with a tattooist, which I think is a ritual experience. I'm like, do you see this? He said, I had no idea we were doing this. But, um, <laughs> There's beautiful artistry and things that come forward. And when the synchronicities yeah. come forward, we've got to take it as a mitzvah. We've got to take it as a blessing that this is the right thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I, I hope I spoke to your point there a little bit. Yes. No, I think you definitely did. I think that part, you know, to try and do a, what do the kids call it now? TLDR, too long, didn't read version. <laughs> Yeah. What you're saying is right that it's like mm -hmm. success is less about these like outward um things and it's more about the ability to really like honor and carry with you like your internal strengths and struggles um yeah. to be grateful for them and I think for you and I know for me this is true it's also to um, really make an impact on the safety and well-being of others. Um, and that um, providing that care and um, that humanity to others is, to me, far more important. And it sounds like to you far more important than any, any degree, any certificate or mm -hmm. any, anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, um, it's been so amazing talking with you. And I just, I think, Mariana, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think now maybe a good time to um, welcome people to ask questions either in the chat or. Yeah, we have so many of Chris's classmates on and who have yeah. been um, putting such nice notes in the chat, which I think will, I think I'll I get a report you, and I'll be able to send those to you. And then I do want to also tell the group, because um, I think that they'll be happy to hear this, that Chris is going to have a a private meeting with the students who are, who yes. are in the group called Spectra, mm. um, which is the LGBTQIA identi self-identifying group um, on 
Tuesday, ne next week, but anyway, he's gonna have a private meeting with them. And so that's that's wonderful that he's available to do that. And then I wanted to say that Katie Holquist is here who nominated Chris. And I don't, <sighs> she's, she, I don't know if they've had a chance to meet. Oh yes, we did. No, I don't know if we, did. We've, we've met, we've met, but I haven't had a chance to. Yes, so I wanted to thank Katie for nominating uh, Chris. Thank and you. Uh, yeah. and and anyway, so that, that's just my preamble. But I would love to hear from the group if there's anyone who wants to take themselves off mute and say something. There's Bruce a lot. Hi, Bruce. Hi there. Oh my I, God. I think, <laughs> hey, Chris. I think I think he's selling himself short as a high school student. He was a very talented tenor in my very first Camerata. But the best Chris Raisbeck story, which is maybe one of the best high school stories ever. Chris was in my class every day. Neither of us was out. He went on to get married and he'll never admit it, but he was on the newlywed game. Yeah. He faded to black. We had nothing to do with each other. And then up came that first Glisten conference in LA. Oh my God. And the school sent me <sighs> and Travis Brownlee to that conference. And I was in line registering mm -hmm. like everybody else to get the little plastic badge with your name on it. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't paying much attention. <laughs> and I got into the L line and mm -hmm. suddenly this blonde bombshell comes <laughs> bursting across the table, probably mm -hmm. would get arrested now, but came up and gave me this huge kiss. And it was <laughs> like the, this amazing moment for me as an ex-teacher, these two guys who were not out to each other. And I don't remember how many years after it was, but you probably do. But it was clearly, we both thought we were at a great historic event. But the thing for me that made it historic was running into Chris. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's interesting, His our stories in our lifetimes, as we touch, I think we've reinforced each other in a very wonderful way. I will say though, and the truth, it, and my classmates know that we did have Bruce in our first year and we gave him help. We were not <laughs> easy on him at all. And I have apologized multiple times since, but um, I do I do want to call it, but you know, Bruce, the first year, boy, he kicked our ass. Cause he's like, okay, you guys gonna, you can read music, great. You need to conduct at the same time. Oh, great. And you need to know the music theory. And, and we're like, you know, we needed to have our butts kicked and he did. And that was not an easy thing to do when you come into a new school, into a new organization where, you know, he, we had three years of our groups of the individuals working together. So you now we're fine, we're good, but he <laughs> kicked our ass and I'm so glad he did. And I think that speaks to where University High School wanted to do to challenge students is, okay, well, if you have this level of ability, let's, let's move it on, let's go. So Bruce, I thank you for both my musical training with that but also that we've maintained friendships and we've watched each other and touched in. And I know he teased me about eight, 10 years ago. He said, what's this gray coming in here? <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much. Chris, we, we have a question in the chat for you um, from Rick Johnson. He says, thank you for your support in helping the homeless um, population during these trying times. Your honor is well-deserved. Does the city have a long-term plan to help these individuals after COVID is over? Will they be forced out of the hotels? Good now, this is, this is a really good question and it's one that we have wondered about. And I know that like right now, the, the facility I am in, we have had we have capacity of about 53 uh, people. We were up close to capacity for about nine months and about a month and a half ago, Suddenly dropped to 12 people, so dropping down to two and one. We're back up to about 18 patients right now in, in here. And we know we're changing the sort of focus. We're also going to now open up this place as a place for people if they've received their vaccine and they're having side effects and they're not sure if they're going to be contagious or not or what their health is. And they just need to have some assistance with that. In terms of the homeless, um, there are some, you know, I think all of us have seen the number of homeless in San Francisco burgeoning in the last 10 years. And it is, it's really tough because, you know, we have an attitude or a thought about, you know, how they may be, but these people, these people, many of the homeless here are people who like you and I had things going on. I have a friend right now who I'm, um, who I was in discussion with, who, 
you know, high level functioner, ran corporate events, um, opened up the seven different Molly Stones in our area. And he had a health condition hit right prior to COVID that put him into a coma for, for about 10 days. So he had recovering like from a stroke. And then following that, so then he had lack, lack, loss of employment. Following that, then COVID hit and the, you know he's not able to really get care or getting all the information lined up. Now we have this additional problem of because he had made lots of money, Medicare and the city won't necessarily get involved with insurance. So he's having some health complications. I mean, it's just one thing these, these tiers knock down. And then when a, when a person loses the housing, then that really tends to move things around. And it's, you know, we can all be resourceful, but the loss of home, or at least this loss of, hello, I, Hi. that's right. The loss of home, as the, the maids are like, what are you doing in there? Um, the loss of, of your home is something that, or a place, safe place to be um, is something that's very important. And I know that we have moved a lot of people in off the streets into uh, a SIPs, shelter in place. And what I know right now is that, uh, for example, I just helped get a gentleman who was homeless into a SIP this week. He, um, he'll be placed there and it's kind of a waiting period about two weeks just to see if the, if the person is handling it pretty well. And he may just remain at that location for some time. Um, I don't know what the city's plan is, and I think the mayor and other people are working hard on this, but I know what, what we have been able to do, while it may not have been enough, it's amazing what we have been able to do because we, the rest of the country is not following our suit in the same way. Um, there are many parts of the country for whom there's not care if you are really in, in trouble. I can't tell you the number of people who were um, had issues in terms of their own shelter or, or if they were experiencing homelessness who arrived here and they were so grateful for at least 10 days. They knew they had a roof over the head, they had shower, they had cable TV and they had the meals delivered here and they could just take a breath, you know, to be able to take a breath so they don't have to worry about their belongings being stolen. They're not gonna have to worry about being molested or anything like that. They could have a place to breathe for a few minutes. Um, and after we finished with them, then we moved them into a shelter. Don't want to put them out on the street. We're putting them back into a system that can then be supportive. So that part of it I can speak to. I don't, I don't know really necessarily what the city's doing um, on long-term planning, but I think we all hope that people can find a place that's gonna be, it's gonna be safe for them and that they can be productive in the way that they, that's gonna be best for them. So. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank, thank you, everybody. You. We're at one o'clock and I know a lot of you are on your lunch hours. Uh, I want to thank Corinne for leading the conversation. I want to congratulate Chris and thank you so much for taking time from your work day sure. for this. It's just an honor to get to talk to you about your life and everything he's accomplished. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we did record this and we will yeah. put it on the web so that other <laughs> alums can um, enjoy it. So on behalf of the oh. Alumni Association, I wanna thank everyone for coming today and check out all of our great programming oh. at uhs.org slash alumni. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. I'm just going through the windows and I'm seeing the names of people and I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled. Thank you everyone for coming in. Love you, Chris. My little story. Thank you so much, everyone. I stay well. Everyone, stay well. Great well. to see you guys. <laughs> Great to see you, Chris. Love you. Bye, Chris. Bye. Bye. Bye.